Well, hello, friends, and welcome to Boston.com's Cocktail Club. I'm Jackson Cannon, and in a minute, I'll be joined by legendary barman Joe McGurk. Tonight, we're making cocktails with Grey Goose Vodka, catching up on the restaurant and bar community, and of course, sharing some tips that pros use to make great drinks at home. When you registered, if you clicked through to Gordon's Wine and Spirits and purchased the Grey Goose Vodka Cocktail Kit, then you have all the ingredients you need. Profits from these kits go to off their plate. This is just an awesome charity. They buy meals from restaurants that need the business and distribute them to frontline workers and others in need. I'm gonna go through everything you need for the session. And of course, we're taking your questions from the chat all the while. Ingredients you'll need, you'll need some vodka. It's great Grey Goose vodka here. This bottle looks just right. It's like here, the one is here, it's so cute. <laughs> Love it so much. Um, to make the first drink, the Palmyra, with your Grey Goose, you're going to need some simple syrup, some lime juice, and some mint. The second drink that we're going to make is the classic Gypsy Queen, and Joe's going to lead us through that. You'll use your vodka with Benedictine, the one and only French herbal liqueur, uh, and a dash of Angostura goes in that, and a little bit of lemon for twist. Equipment-wise, you need a shaker. If you purchase the kit, you get this great shaker from Grey Goose in your kit. Um, if you didn't, you can use uh, a regular shaker. Of course, if you um, can always use something like a deli cup container or a mason jar or something that seals with a good lid, you can get a shake on that citrus cocktail and be off to the races. We're going to stir that Gypsy Queen, however. So um, if you have one of these kind of nice mixing glasses, this is a great time to use it. If not, you can use one end of the shaker as well or any kind of large glass vessel that lets those ingredients mix come together and be diluted and chilled with the ice. Um, you'll need a Hawthorne strainer for your shaker, maybe a tea strainer if you wanna get all the little pieces of mint out as well. Um, not too much heavy garnish work, but I always like to have my cutting board knife and plate ready. You will be using your peeler to make that uh, garnish on the Gypsy Queen as well. Glassware is pretty straight ahead. I'm gonna use this classic coupe um, and uh, and I'm going to use the Nick and Nora instead of the V-shape on my stirred drink. And uh, ice, just regular cubed ice. I'm going to get a, a, you know, we like these nice little one-by-ones that we make with these molds that we get at the local uh, everything store. Um, you can find those online really easy as well. I'm just going to put a couple of ice cubes in here. So while I'm talking, while we're getting ready, little chills being had on the glassware. So when we make the drink and it goes into a cold glass, First sip's going to be great no matter what, but the last sip may be just a little colder because we did that. A um, couple of questions from the registration. Uh, Jane from Maine asks, how do you know when to stir versus shake? And I think that's just a great question to bring up, Jane. We generally shake things that have citrus juices um, and stir things that are built off of spiritus liqueurs. The reason for that is we want those air bubbles to help the texture of the citrus be pleasant. We don't need them the other one. So we want to keep the drink sinewy and smooth. And tonight's a perfect exercise in that one-two punch. So you get to see them both. Love that you're watching from Maine, Kay. And uh, uh, June, Jane. And Kay asks that she's been wanting to buy some coupe glasses and she doesn't know what size to get. So this is about six and a half ounce coupe right here, uh, Kay. And um, so you may have noticed that these classic cocktails, almost all of them are about three ounces of ingredients, maybe just a tiny bit less, maybe a little bit more. We put those together with ice, either shaken or stirred, they'll pick up an ounce to an ounce and a half of water, right? So looking at something that's four and a half, under five, you know, up to five ounces. And um, so you want a glass that's got just a little bit room above that. So anything in that six to seven ounce range, if these are the kind of cocktails you like. If you like big bubbly champagne cocktails that are usually built that way and have a few ounces of champagne added, well now you wanna be in that nine, 10, 11, maybe even grand 12 ounce coupe range. Hope that that is helpful. All right, 30 years ago, seems like yesterday, Joe McGurk took a summer job as a service bartender at Christopher's Restaurant in Cambridge, Mass. He's been behind bars ever since. From there, legendary stints at Chez Henri and the B-Side Lounge solidified Joe's reputation as a guest first bartender. The solid application of the craft was accentuated by his knowledge of current events, sports, and cultural trends. With a few furloughs, he spent the last 14 years at Highland Kitchen, and he can now also be found at Will Gilson's new cocktail spot, the Lexington, at Cambridge Crossing. Joe's dedication to the community has him making a run for Cambridge City Council. And while he is the father of two amazing cho children, he earned his nickname Pops as much by his sturdy position in the restaurant community and unflappable demeanor behind the bar. You can support him directly by hitting his Venmo. 
It's at Joe Dash McGurk. He is a great bartender, a good friend, not afraid to make some vodka cocktails. Welcome, Joe. Thank you very much, Jackson. Great to see you. That's such a pleasure to have you, man. You've been Absolutely. such a big influence on my life as just a consummate professional bartender all these years. I think it was a bad influence even before you were a bartender, as I recall correctly. I, I didn't need a bad influence, but yeah, I think you're right. You know, you, I think I, I, I didn't learn it in the moment, but I've, I've listened back to the time I remember you cutting me off here and there and, uh, and tried to use that to be as diplomatic and gracious in my service even when my service extends to not serving alcohol. I learned that and so many things from you. Thanks for being on Cocktail Sub, bro. Uh, great to be here, excited. Hey, tell us a little bit about Highland Kitchen for those who may not have been out that way. Sure, Highland Kitchen is a little, a little restaurant that couldn't. Uh, it's a tiny little uh, neighborhood bar up in uh, Spring Hill in Somerville. It opened up in 2007. It started a couple of weeks after they opened. It's owned by a couple that I actually was a bartender at their first date. Uh, 15 years prior to them um, opening up Highland. <clears throat> um, Mark uh, Romano and Marcy Joy own Highland Kitchen. Um, it's, uh, you know, features pretty straightforward American fare with uh, some fun things. That's, uh, Mark's very well known for his uh, curried coconut, um, coconut curried goat stew. Uh, everybody loves the buffalo fried Brussels sprouts and um, our bolognese was named uh, top five in New England some years ago. Um, they also own uh, Highland Fried um, at the old location of the East Coast Grill in Cambridge, um, a fried chicken and ribs joint. Yeah, that's so, outstanding. So, so Highland Fried is open right now. Highland Kitchen is opening soon. Correct. Yeah. So, since they're a you know mom and pop kind of place, they're just the two of them. It's kind of hard to get two restaurants open right during this uh, kind of trying times. Highland uh, Fried, because of its ability to serve outdoors really easily. Um, is the one they've been focusing on. That one's going pretty strongly. And in the first couple of weeks of June, we're hoping to open up Highland Kitchen. Um, you know, it's going to be a little more limited than it was in the past. The menu is going to be a little smaller as we try to ramp up. But uh, yeah, shooting for early June. Uh, well, that's, that. that's outstanding. So, yeah. um, and, and tell us a little bit quickly about uh, Will's new place at Cambridge Crossing. So Will's also, probably many people know Will has uh, Puritan and Company in Inman Square. It's just a great restaurant with uh, farm's table food. The Lexington is at and, uh, Cambridge Crossing. I called it Leech Mare when I was young, but it's at the nexus of um, right. yeah, <laughs> McGrath and uh, Cambridge Street in East Cambridge. Um, it's kind of in a complex. It's, um, he calls it the Hotel Without Rooms. On the first floor, there's Cafe Beatrice, which is a awesome uh, cafe with pastries made by Brian Mercury, who's just an incredible pastry chef. And upstairs is um, the Lexington, a cocktail bar with food by Will Gilson with a roof deck that overlooks a pretty beautiful um, new neighborhood in Cambridge, Cambridge Cross. Well, what nights are you there? Is it, I'm there Fridays and Saturdays right now. Um, as we go into the summer, I'll probably do some more when we open up the outside. It's a huge um, uh, plaza then that we're gonna open up and have an outdoor bar and some frozen margaritas for the summer. I can't wait, I can't yeah, wait. Awesome. Hey. Speaking of cocktails, I'm getting a little thirsty while we're talking. Shall we make uh, Shall we make one and then keep the conversation going? Absolutely, let's um, do it. All right, I'm going to lead us through the Palmyra. This is the drink that launched a thousand ships. Um, this is a variation on uh, vodka gimlet with mint, created by Tom Masticola at Number Nine Park in 1998. Um, which is uh, getting back there. This is a great, refreshing entree into like kind of craft cocktail technique and flavors. Um, and I'm gonna build it kind of top down. I know that the kids these days, they'll use the least expensive ingredient first is their way of kind of working backwards. I can work either direction, but I'm going top down. I'm gonna use main ingredient first. I'm gonna put the uh, vodka in here. I'm gonna do two ounces of Grey Goose. And I'm gonna follow that with three quarters of an ounce uh, simple syrup and lime juice. Um, juice the lime, you know, just uh, kind of right before we got started. It's easy to do if you have one of these little hand presses. It's uh, it's about the juice of a, of a of a regular lime. Maybe a, you can get or a stingy lime. You can still get three quarters out of. Um, and uh, I like it when it sits out for just about like 20, 30 minutes. Kind of softens it up just a touch. And I got a one-to-one -one simple syrup here that I'm gonna use. Just one part sugar, one part water, hence the name. 
And now here, this is where this is a little different than the way they do it at number nine. And if you really love this drink and you want to prep up for a no fuss, no muss, big party, you can make like a mint simple syrup like they do. Um, I'm just going to do it with live mint. And it's about, uh, about six, five, six, seven mint leaves. And we're going to just pulverize those together here with a firm shake going into a chilled coupe glass. And you can do this, people, are, people ask, you know, should it be up or on the rocks? That is a total personal preference. This, uh, I'm gonna enjoy this in this, uh, in this light coupe. It's got a nice chill on it. But you can have it on crush. That's that sound we love. Still makes my mouth water too every time I hear it. Shake it, go up. Okay. Now I'm just going to use uh, Hawthorne into a tea strainer here. Um, those of you making this drink at home, you'll see right when you when you open that up, you get that fresh blast of of mint. And now, if you're going in a V-shaped glass. Um, there's lots of clever ways you can garnish this with a, like a little bit of a, a slice of lime peel and some, um, you know, and or some mint leaves if you're on crushed ice, a little mint sprig. When you're in a coupe glass like this, I think it's perfect just the way it is. You, you look at this and if you've done it right, you've got those little droplets of air trapped across the top, the wash line, the signs of life as it were. Um, I'm going to dive right in, Joe. You got one too? Hell yeah. So Cheers to you, bro. Confession. The very first cocktail I ordered in a bar was a vodka gimlet. There you go. That's a that's a great first. Yeah, that was way before my bartending career started. It's like saying the first movie you saw was The Godfather. <laughs> Inspired by a Raymond Chandler novel. I tried. I ordered a pina colada, and uh, I don't think they put any rum in it. Well, you were sixteen, so who could blame them, right? I was yeah, <laughs> fifteen. Yeah, exactly. So. Another uh, another exercise in great bartending, right? That's exactly right. exactly right. Oh, I'm very impressed by the texture of this cocktail. You know, it's uh, it's just perfect. You know, it. it I think. Um, mm. So obviously, the fresh lime is is key to these cocktails. Any fresh citrus cocktail, fresh always juice. is. You know, and and like. It, what's so interesting in this long line of herbal gimlets that come from this cocktail being created, right? Uh, the Au Provence at Eastern Standard, the Perennial, uh, the, the Ardois at Craigie, the, the Springtime, T-H-Y-M-E. Love that one at Cook and Brown in Providence. Um, if this is, you're really, what you're doing is you're taking a, a vodka gimlet and you're kind of bending it towards a gin gimlet. You're adding a single botanical. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's, uh, it's definitely, um, it's definitely like, while it's a, a wide open door for a person to come into craft cocktails, I think it's, uh, um, it, it's also like drawing them into that world of flavor with each sip. Absolutely. There are a lot of people who, who um, tell me that they don't like gin. And what we discover as we experiment is that they didn't like tonic water or whatever it was that they had in their first gin drink. Right, um, right. And a way to get them there is to start them off with, you know, never challenge them. Let's, let's turn them out to cocktails. If vodka is the way we get them in, that's it's great. And at the end of the day, I still drink a lot of vodka even 30 years after or 40 well, years after. Been, my day. Well, what's been so interesting to me too is I, I went on a, a big tear when I was like, uh, you know, really watching calories at a certain point for, you know, a given reason. And I, I started taking in what vodka. Exactly you said, know, you're watching what? What are they called? Uh, this was years ago, briefly, <laughs> briefly. <laughs> Um, I was drinking vodka and water kind of when I was playing, I was, I was dealing with trying to be in a little bit better shape playing music and stuff. And I was doing very, very plain things with it. And, you know, I think the knock on it is, is really backwards. You know, people are like, it's just vodka or it's, yeah. I mean, when you talk to real serious distillers and they, they hear people say something like, well, they're just making vodka while the whiskey ages. Vodka is one of the most difficult things to distill. You know, it's all right out there you know you've got your ingredients but that's a muted component that you're trying nuanced expression you're trying to get out of this 
the spirit and you know if you aren't good at distilling it shows you know correct you can't mask it with oak you can't mask it with any of the other things that you know adding something to it that um that you know perhaps other distillers you know making other spirits could get could get to do so mm -hmm. 100 percent right well we're taking some questions about uh about why we chose uh, Grey Goose. We're really grateful for their sponsorship in here. It's one of my favorite vodkas to use, and we're really lucky to have on hand their brand ambassador, Moa Zaza, to tell us a little bit more about all that goes into making this exceptional uh, distillate. So Mo's going to join us in a second here. There he is. Hey, good to see you, Mo. Hey, hey, everybody. How, how are we doing this afternoon? You guys are winning all day long. What a, what a great way to spend an afternoon of World Cocktail Day, making Palmyras and speaking to a category that's, you know, one very near and dear, you know, to me, kind of like to echo what Jackson just said. It's, it's, a, it's a category that somewhat gets a bit of a knock, but it is one of the most interesting and one of the most challenging categories to distill. And so with Grey Goose, we've got our, our maitre de chez in uh, Francois Tabolt, who's, uh, you know, he comes from a cognac making background. And with that, uh, there's an attention to detail that, uh, that most of the brands in the vodka category don't seem to get. So one of the things that we love about, about Grey Goose and the things that, that we love to talk about are exactly, you know, those elements, right? It's what are the ingredients? How is it that these decisions were made in order to make, you know, one of the world's best tasting, if not the world's best tasting vodka? And when you think about that, right, tasting vodka, uh, you know, typically a category spoken to as a, you know, essentially a, an odorless and flavorless category. Uh, but as, as Jackson and Joe just talked about, it's if they, uh, if the distiller does anything wrong, it's going to stand out and there's no way to mask it. And so that cleanliness is part of it. And so with Grey Goose, you're going to get, you know, beautiful, soft winter wheat from the Picardy region of France, which is the breadbasket of France. Um, you couple that with, uh, you know, one of the major ingredients in any distillation, and that's water that's coming directly from the springs of the Gemsack River. Um, and now you can definitely allow for the five-step distillation process that goes into Grey Goose to really stand out. And Francois has done an amazing job at continuing that, uh, at continuing that, that beautiful sense of, of, of a category that's, you know, made wonderfully, made beautifully, made very cleanly. Um, and so I think texture is something that uh, both Jackson and Joe just chatted about. And that's where, for me personally, is where it stands out above the rest. That texture is really there. And you can make just about any cocktail with, uh, you know, any vodka-based cocktail or any gin-based cocktail, really. And uh, Grey Goose will allow for that texture to really come through. So, you know, hopefully uh, you folks have, have gotten a little, bit, uh, a little bit at home and get to try this delicious cocktail uh, alongside the next cocktail that, uh, that these wonderful gentlemen are about to make. Well, Mo, thanks so much for talking to us about Grey Goose and for your support of Cocktail Club. It's really great to see you. Thank you so much. Have a, have a great afternoon and enjoy making them call. Cheers. Happy World Cocktail Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Well. Well. I thought every day was World Cocktail Day. <laughs> in my world, it is. <laughs> I want to live in your world, Joe. Traditionally, it's which, off, but yeah, it is here. Um, speaking of which, let's get into your world with the Gypsy Queen you wrote so eloquently about on Boston.com. Uh, right on, uh, Gypsy Queen. So um, I don't know if you had a chance to read it, but one of uh, my big, the big sins in my book is to uh, um, to scorn a customer's order. And a lot of times, some young bartenders might tr treat a vodka cocktail order like that, um, when in fact vodka has a long, awesome history in American cocktails. And this is allegedly the very first um, American cocktail, right? I wouldn't put too much stock in the stories you hear about cocktails, like that I invented the priorities or anything. But, you know, it's a good story. I invented at the Russian uh, Tea House in New York. Um, I am going to stir my drink. You can grab a fancy, um, you know, mixing glass like this, or you can use anything, right? I'm going to use my fluff vest. Um, 
my fluff fest pint glass. I uh, like to pour spirits and stir drinks over over ice. So I'm going to start by filling my glass up, up with ice. I too have a um, Nick and Nora glass that I'll be pouring this into. Uh, these are beautiful glasses, predating the martini glasses. I picked this one up actually at um, the Boston Shake, a really great locally owned business at Davis Square in Somerville. Um, it's great for home bars. It's great for um, uh, for pro bartenders too. Just want to give a shout out. Everybody's been, it's been tough times for a lot of people the last year and a half. So let's shout out to these guys. So like I said, I'm going to start by uh, filling my uh, mixing glass up with ice. And I'm going to put a, quite a bit of ice in there. I like to dilute it. So um, I'm not going to be afraid. I, of course, picked my ice out too early and don't have the cool mold that Jackson has. So I want to make sure I strain out any water that I might get in there. You that's, know, a great pro tip. Get... that's a great pro tip. What are you spooning that with you? Just a regular spoon there, Joe? Just a regular spoon. I have a slotted one, but I just use this regular spoon. I don't, you know, I, I it's shocking that I didn't bring an uh, ice scoop home with me, but I just don't like having too much equipment. So I'm going to strain that water out. Um, and I'm sorry if I go too fast. I'm just legendarily really fast at cutting water. I'll try <laughs> to slow it down for the audience at home. Um, I think Jackson asked me to do this one because this drink is super complex. And it might be difficult to do at home, but I'm going to ask you to try it along with me. We're going to take a measuring device that has at least one ounce measured on it. This is a, a two over one, right? There's two ounces over one ounce. And this is going to be great for this drink because this is all I need. But if you only happen to have like an OXO um, cup, you can measure it on there. And if you only have an ounce, if you have a shot glass that's just an ounce, you can use that too. Just yeah, just, I, I just want to throw in here too, if, if a tablespoon is the only tool you have, that's a half an ounce. So when he says two ounces, tables, four tablespoons. Excellent, excellent point. All right, it is two ounces of Grey Goose vodka or whichever vodka you have at home. That's the angel's portion right there. Nice. One ounce of Benedictine. Benedictine was um, was perhaps a gift from God. 1510, there was a monk in um, Fleury in France, and he, he developed this recipe, thankfully, for all humanity in the 1880s. I know, I know, from, I know from your own writing that you know that that isn't true, you know? I, I love this about <laughs> you. Tell the tall tale today, you know? As I have often said, you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Mm -hmm. And um, you want some aromatic bitters. There are a lot of great bitters out there, right? This is Angostura, probably the classic this is Angostura orange, which is also good if you little, like a little bit of spice. Uh, a couple dashes of that. You can, I do it at the end. I, the reason I, I do that is so it doesn't cling to the ice too much. You can actually dilute it, so. It's just so really quickly, Joe, a question coming in on the chat for somebody who doesn't have Benedictine, for which there is no substitute. Can I use chartreuse, falernum, or... Um, or a little bit of allspice dram. That's a tough one. Um, of course. The truth is that uh, cocktail recipes are not blueprints, but jumping off points, right? Um, if those are the flavors you've had at home because you like those flavors, then I think that it's a, um, a good idea to fool around with them. I just think the chartreuse, if you're going chartreuse, maybe go three to one instead of two to one. Well, that's another point. I think that's an excellent point. And that's that, that's that drink that you and I both love more or less the Alaska. Exactly, right? Little orange bitters. If you have some aromatic bitters, you throw that in there as well. Um, so straining, straining it, right? Take your julep strainer, whatever it is, just stop that ice from going in there. This is a five and a half ounce, um, five and a half ounce Nick and Nora. I knew I was gonna fill it up too high. Um, so that drink, which is only a, a, a little bit over three, I diluted it too much, well, you know, I diluted it down to that. Take your peeler, don't go too deep. Express Friends, the notice he peeled that, he peeled that lemon right over the drink. Yep. Can, can Sorry about that. Those. You want to do it right there. Express that lemon right over the drink. If you want to, you can gently rip the glass with the outside of the peel. You can throw this right in the drink if you like. Let's see what Jackson does. On the Nick and Nora, I'm going to throw it over my shoulder. If this exactly. was, We're throw it if this was a V-shaped martini, right? I would trim the edges and drop it in. But that's oh. right. And uh, you should drink it. Oh, cheers. Salute. Mm, get that honey and that spice. 
Benedictine is by its nature sweet. This recipe is two to one. That's the traditional recipe, but you should adjust it as your taste goes. If this is too sweet for you, do three to one like Jackson said about the uh, chartreuse based drink. There are people who do six to one, six parts vodka to one, just like a martini, wetter or drier, right? This one, a little more honey, a little less. Although I think that this actually, this is just perfect the way it is. You can tell I have a sweet tooth. Yeah, but this is the kind of sweet that's like, um, the hotter it gets, the more refreshing this gets. I mean, it's so interesting to me because this is technically the way we organize drinks in terms of how they're built. You, you would see this as much as the martini as anything, martini variation as anything else. It drinks to me more like a New Orleans cocktail, even though it's yeah. vodka based. It's just right. It feels like a like a, a De La Louisiane or a, sure. almost Sazerac in a way, yeah. you know, like. Yeah, yeah, um, I can see that. And it's just um, the kind of the bulbousness of it and, uh, you know, like this deep, dark cinnamon with honey. And yeah, there's some complexity going on there, too. And the more you drink it, the more that you're getting. And the truth is, the more it warms up, the more people taste. Although I've never let it get too warm. Well, our friend who tried the chartreuse said it's very good. Oh, awesome. I, I did like your point about that. It's like, well, if you got a bottle of chartreuse at your house, you probably like that flavor, right? Yeah. So. Um, why don't you throw that in the place of vermouth on a couple of different things and see, see what happens. You, know? you can make yourself, there's a, there's a whole family of cocktails. I don't know if you've gotten through them in the club yet, but there's a whole family of cocktails that chartreuse is going to be necessary for. So, uh. hmm. Yeah, chartreuse is a tough one. You know, it's a luxury ingredient that doesn't come in the small bottles. No, it doesn't. The, Although it shares uh, some similarities with Benedictine in that at any point in time, there are only five people who know the recipe. Chartreuse. Well, the chartreuse tale is is magnificent and and every bit as true as the uh, Benedictine yeah. one is a little bit suspect. What's wonderful about the Benedictine story is that it we do know that it the hype was completely created out of the mind of Alexander Legrand, who was also a master distiller, a scientist, a, a world marketer, a collector, a, a benefactor of the arts. Uh, all these things. If I had a time machine and could go back to that period of Europe, it's, it was a terrible period in the United States. But in the 1860s in Europe, there were a lot of people practicing really kind of amazing things. And, and Legrand was one of them. And he was inventing Benedictine and telling everybody with a, you know, with a sly wink the way a good barman like you does, Joe. Hey, it's from it's the monks. Yeah. Uh, there's, um, it's the, the birthplace of Blue Curse. Right. It's uh, the, the 1860s in France. Um, a lot of people associate that with the 1970s. I say, oh no, it's the, uh, that was a World's Fair concoction. Well, Joe, people want to know what your favorite summer porch sipper is, since you mentioned cocktails outside and it's such a lovely day. So I would, um, I remember saying that, uh, telling somebody, I think it was somebody with the globe, um, that my, I never liked the margarita until I had one that I made. I think that the greatest summer cocktail, in fact, the greatest year round cocktail is the margarita. So you will find me often mixing up margaritas at home and the key ingredients to margaritas. Are, we have um, one of them right here is a fresh lime juice and tequila, silver tequila in my case. Beyond that, there's so many. There's a drink, uh, the Presbyterian is always a classic favorite of mine in summer or winter, but especially when I'm sitting on my porch. Um, a way to drink browns, a lot of people uh, think of the summer as a time to not drink brown spirits, right? But uh, there's nothing better than, um, in my opinion, a, a crown yeah. press. Yeah, tell people about the press in a little bit more detail because that's a lesser known highball, I think, these days. Yeah, so um, it's funny. This is a drink that I started drinking about 25 years ago after reading, like where a lot of the my knowledge about or even hearing about cocktails was from fiction. And there's a great book called Notes from a Lonely Island by a writer named um, Fred Exley. And uh, the character kept drinking vodka presses. And I did not know what he meant. It's actually more than 25, it's embarrassing, it's almost 30 years ago. So I did some investigation, I discovered what a press was. A press, um, a vodka press is vodka with equal parts soda and ginger, or a Presbyterian. Um, I, however, like brown spirits, and I think more commonly was the Presbyterian, which was with scotch originally with uh, soda and ginger, which would make a lot more sense with its name. Um, I prefer to drink it with Canadian whiskey, which I think is underutilized. It's a great 
Um, Canadian whiskeys are often great in cocktails, I think, in the same way that vodka is, that they don't overpower the drink. Uh, so my favorite summer cocktail is, um, you know, when I'm not drinking margaritas, is a crown press. I prefer it without citrus, but a lot of people like to uh, put a, lime, a lemon twist on there, a lemon wedge. It's that. I mean, I drink anything in the summertime. But light lime, margarita, also awesome. Hey, where do you stand on people keeping their vodka in the freezer? Oh, I, if, the, if the Russians do it, it's good enough for us. Like, you want your vodka cold. Like, the, you, you know, I'm, I'm nev I've never been against vodka. Um, I, like, again, because of my love of reading, I read a lot of the Russians, and they drink their vodka in every fashion, but they drink it cold, very cold, very often. I think that it's not going to hurt the spirit, and um, there are some things that are best served cold. Revenge yeah, is not the only one. So, what it, especially if you like to drink it straight or in a very simple way that isn't mixed with any other ingredients, because you know when we're making these cocktails, we're putting the ingredients together, but we're putting water into the spirit. And when we do that, they get fuller, um, and and so you can also achieve that goal on a straight spirit by getting it colder. And so, like that kind of magic of that very chilled sip. Why is that? Why is it better? Because it so often is, is because the texture is improved. Sure, and it hasn't been diluted. It has the same. It has the, that same texture. Well, it even has a you know a texture that hasn't been diluted. It has the yeah. the bracingness of the, the cold world in a way. Yeah, right? but exactly. Yep. So, yeah, keep the vodka in the freezer. Want right next to your sambuca. Not that yeah, you can doesn't. you can you could actually you could actually mix this drink together in these bottles and put them back in the freezer. Brilliant idea, brilliant. You know, idea. and then just just get yeah. home and pour a little Gypsy Queen over a, an ice cube and yeah. you're off to the races. Yeah, do that at home though. You don't want to be getting behind the wheel of a car after you do that. So. You know, that's one you know thing. If we if we've learned it, you know, a little more drinking at home is a good thing. You know, I saw today Texas passed. Uh, and, and they signed into law permanent cocktails, wine, spirits, and beer to go from bars and restaurants. And this is That's a really important, yeah. really important issue, you know, and it, it, every state has like, you know, layers of government that's there to protect and serve. And, uh, you know, you're running for council yourself, to try and have a positive effect on your community. And um, this is just one of those things we have to get in Massachusetts. It's really essential to the health of the restaurants. But the, the irony is, is that it's safer. And you think it's not, but it is. And the first time I realized that, Joe, was one, one of those early trips, we, those pilgrimages we've all made many times to New Orleans. And you never hear anybody say, drink them up and let's go. They say, do you want that to go? And so yeah. you don't finish this just because you're getting in your car. You put it in a glass and walk down the street with it and you might take another sip and toss it out when you get to the next place, you know? Like, um, and so that I just found it so much more civilized and in fact, Places don't close. They don't kick everybody out at the same time. They don't. Everybody racing to pound a bunch of drinks before one a.m. So absolutely, it's 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 ridiculous, right? Where when we like you said, it's safer. It is ultimately safer. The times I've been to New Orleans, um, I have to get counseled by the bartenders that I don't have to pound my drink. And and um, you know, after drinking in Boston for so many decades, that's a hard habit to break. But I, like you said, it is more civilized. It's been really great to see the support for um, people who want to take these cocktails home with them. And uh, I understand that, uh, you know, there are a lot of concerns with those decisions, but clearly the people would like craft cocktails. Sometimes they want to have them made by their favorite bartender and they want to enjoy them at home. It's a great. Listen, the, the, I think our biggest concern should be, hey, do they, do, do they travel well? <laughs> like, is, you know, because other than that, like, I, I really think, you know, should we be able to sell a kit where you can make it when you get home or how we how we do it, I think should be a, a robust and interesting debate, but whether we have it, it's an essential, easy thing that everyone deserves to give a shot to. So hopefully we'll get it permanently. Yeah. Hey Joe, that's all the time we have for Cocktail Club. It's been just a pleasure having you. If the time um, is going by so fast, Jackson, I can't believe I told, it. I told you it, it, it would be, well, we'll do it again soon. How about that? Will you come back? Sounds great. Sounds awesome. Great. Well, Thanks. we're here every Thursday, 7 p.m. Thanks so much for joining us, friends. Uh, tune in next week. We've got Bombay Sapphire Gin Cocktails. Make sure to follow the link from the sign-up page to Gordon's Wine and Spirits to pick up the Boston.com Bombay Sapphire Cocktail Kit. 
You'll be supporting off their plate and getting everything you need for next week's Boston.com Cocktail Club. Thanks to Great Goose. Thanks to Mo. Thanks to you, Joe, especially. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Hello. Cheers.